All right, so generating solutions. Now we've prioritized what we're considering doing. We need to figure out what can I do about it. And for this one, we've got a select all that apply, everybody's favorite. And so in this case, we've got a client who just had a coronary angiography and it was via a femoral artery approach. And so which of these interventions do we anticipate including in the initial post-procedure care, select all that apply? So here's a tip for select all that apply on the NCLEX. You wanna treat each option as if it's its own true or false question, okay? So let's do a quick refresher on what a coronary angiography is. So here's a picture of one being done. And what is this done to treat, you guys? So what condition is a coronary angiography done to treat? And there are a couple, but the number one big one that we uh, should all be familiar with is this is your emergent intervention for a STEMI. And that is because what we do here is they're actually going to give a puncture here into the femoral artery and thread this stylus up. They're going to inject contrast dye to visualize under an x-ray where the blockage in the artery is. All right, you guys have some, yes, MI, CAD, yes. So that's treating this and that's going to help them visualize that blockage and stent it open. All right, so which of these interventions would we do? So true or false, we should place the client on a fluid restriction. And the NCLEX would love to ask you this because they think you're going to confuse this with a heart failure patient where that might be appropriate. But there's one organ that hates IV contrast more than any other organ. Which organ is that? That we gave a ton of IV contrast in this study. We injected a lot of contrast dye and there's one organ that really hates IV contrast and that is your kidneys, correct? Good, so this person is at high risk for contrast nephropathy or acute kidney injury. And so what, what we have to do for that is we have to give a lot of fluids to flush out that contrast. So we need to give a lot of IV fluids or if they're taking oral, a lot of oral fluids. We are not gonna put them on a fluid restriction. That would be more appropriate for someone with heart failure, good. All right, are we gonna monitor the puncture site for swelling? And I see that several of you chose to, and yes, that's true because we just gave this person, in the case of an MI, a ton of aspirin, a ton of heparin, and then we made a puncture in one of the largest, largest arteries in their body. So they are at really high risk for bleeding, and we're definitely going to, every four minutes, every uh, 15 minutes, so four times an hour, go in, pull back their covers, look at their groin site, and make sure they're not developing a hematoma, or like this big tennis ball size bruise there. So this is definitely appropriate. Good. Are we going to place the client on continuous cardiac monitoring? And yes, of course we are. This is one of the first things they should, we should do. They should never even leave the cath lab without this on the bed with them, right? Because we just went in there and kind of tickled the heart. And so they're at high risk for dysrhythmias, or if that stent occludes, they could start to have some ST elevation again. And the only way that we're going to see that is if we have them on the monitor. So yes, we need to do cardiac monitoring. Next, should we assist them up to the chair to prevent atelectasis? And this sounds like a good idea because we want to prevent a complication, right? We want to prevent somebody from getting atelectasis. And there are several ways we could do that, like our turn, cough, deep breathing exercises. But in this client, should we get them up out of the chair in the immediate initial post-procedure care? Gary's Joy says no. Anne says, no, you guys are right, because these clients, remember, need to be on strict bed rest. So they are on bed rest for usually four to six hours. They've got to stay completely flat. And that is important because that groin site here, this injection site, if they bend at the waist, if they cough too hard even or bear down, that's going to put a lot of pressure down on the site and going to risk hemorrhage. So they have got to stay totally flat for six hours. And really, they're not at that high of a risk for atelectasis anyway, because this is a short procedure, like maybe an hour, an hour and a half. All right, palpating the client's bilateral pedal pulses every 15 minutes for the first hour. And I think you guys understand now that we are worried about bleeding in this patient. And this is going to be helpful to us because we want to make sure that this blood is traveling from the heart down to the extremities and not leaking out into their abdominal space or into the leg. And so the only way we can really tell that is to look at the groin site and to go down at their feet and feel and make sure those pulses are equal. So you might see uh, maybe you're assessing somebody on the NCLEX after an angiography and they have a weak pedal pulse on one side. 
that is an emergency. We need to worry about that because that means they're not getting as much blood as they should past that insertion site. All right, so awesome, you guys. Um, our users averaged about 80% on this, so this is important stuff for you to know. And remember, the bootcamp question bank is all completely up to date with all the next gen scoring rules. And so anytime you get a SATA question and partial credit, you're going to get the scoring rule for that as well to help you out there.